This video is about the Bellman-Ford algorithm for computing the shortest paths between points in a network, or more generally between nodes in a graph. Now Bellman-Ford and Dijkstra's algorithm will both produce the exact same results, but Dijkstra's algorithm requires knowledge of the entire topology of the network. For this network that we'll be using in this video, knowledge of the connectivity and link costs of the whole network is needed by the Dijkstra's algorithm. But Bellman Ford only requires local information from neighboring nodes in order to compute the shortest paths, which makes it more ideal for a network where transmitting information costs time. This information can be transmitted between nodes in Dijkstra's algorithm, but it creates potentially significant network overhead. To do the Bellman-Ford approach to calculating the shortest paths, we will once again use a table, but with different entries. The table will look like this. This table has some similarities with the table we used in the previous video to calculate shortest paths using Dijkstra's algorithm, but there are some significant differences. The far left column now has a value h. This is the hop count, which is the number of jumps in the network. For example, from 7 to 4 is one hop, regardless of the actual cost of that link. Now, as with the previous video, we are computing paths from vertex 7, and you would have to repeat this process for each node or vertex in this graph slash network. The algorithm progresses by determining the shortest path that has at most this many hops, one row at a time. Now, another difference between this algorithm and Dijkstra's algorithm is the presence of this subscript h in the length counts. So this column indicates the length of a route from the seven to the one, using at most one hop. Now, if no such path exists, we'll leave the length as infinite. Um, so given that setup, let's step through the algorithm one row at a time. So very first, there is no path from V7 to V1 in one hop. Therefore, the length of such a path is effectively infinity and the path itself is left blank or empty. The same is true for paths to v2 and v5. The only vertices that we can reach from v7 in one hop are 4, 3, and 6. For v6, the cost of the one hop path is 5 because of this directed link. For Vertex 3, the path is from 7 to 3 with a cost of 2, and to vertex 4, the cost is 1. And that completes this row. And at the next step, we now consider how many nodes we can reach within two hops of V7 and what those costs are. And we will always update our estimate to be the minimal cost regardless of the number of hops. This means that we will now be able to find a path to v6 which has a lower cost because from v7 if we make one two hops the cost of that path is one plus one equal to two. So that will replace our path to v6 and we'll go through a similar process with the rest of these vertices. So given only two hops we are actually able to reach every vertex in this graph, although some of the routes are fairly inefficient. We'll eventually fix that. But we have to take the shortest possible path within two hops to each of these vertices. Notice that there are actually two different routes from V7 to V2 that contain two hops. We can go from seven to six to two for a cost of five, plus one equals six, or we can go from seven to three to two for a cost of two 
plus 3 equals 5. So this is the shorter route in terms of cost, and so that will be what we put in the column for 2. We are also able to reach vertex 1 now via vertex 3 because of this long link over the top. The cost of that is 7 plus 2 for 9, and we can now reach vertex 5 via vertex 6 for a cost of 5 plus 2 equals 7. Now, if we only consider paths with two hops, then the routes to vertex 3 and 4 will not change. In fact, we can tell from our human perspective of looking closely at this graph, or perhaps from simply revisiting the Dijkstra's algorithm video, that these costs will not change. We have actually already found the shortest paths from vertex 7 to vertices 4 and 3. So these values will never change. However, strictly speaking, from the perspective of the algorithm, there's not really certainty there. We could reason that because this cost is 1 and all of the other costs outgoing from 7 were more than that, that there's no way to eventually loop back to that vertex at a lower cost. But we don't have the same kind of simple assurance that we had with Dijkstra's algorithm. So I'm going to keep rewriting these values as the algorithm would. We're going to check them every time, even though we, from our human viewpoint, know these values will not change. Now we can take three hops and we will find some shorter paths yet again. Starting from 7 and going to v1, the shortest path is now to go from 7 to 3 to 2 to 1, and the cost of that is 2 plus 3 plus 2 equals 7. The shortest path to vertex 2 also changes because now we can take a route that goes through vertex 4. We'll go 7, 4, 6, 2 for a cost of 1 plus 1 plus 1 equals 3. As we mentioned before, the routes to vertices 3 and 4 do not change, so I'll write those in. The route to vertex 5 does improve, once again because we can go through vertex 4 to circumvent this expensive link between 7 and 6. So the three hop route to vertex 5 is 7, 4, 6, 5 for a cost of 1, 2, 3, 4. Our route to vertex 6, however, does not change. And in fact, we know that it will not change from this point onward. Next, we will consider routes using four hops. And we once again find a more efficient route, this time to vertex 1, because a better route than this three hop route we discovered is one that goes through vertex 4, then 6, then 2, then 1 for a cost of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. The rest of the columns do not change, so I'll quickly write those in. And now we are ready to consider routes that have five hops. Now, strictly speaking, the number of hops that the algorithm needs to consider to guarantee that it finds all shortest paths is the number of total vertices in the graph minus one. We have seven vertices, therefore I've written in six rows here. The reason for this is that with seven vertices, the most hops that any two vertices could be separated by is six. However, if for a particular graph we know that no two vertices are more than a certain number of hops away from each other, then that smaller number is actually the value that we could use to restrict the number of iterations required by this algorithm. This value is known as the network diameter. However, for the sake of simplicity, and to be fully general, we'll simply assume we have to at least go up to the number of vertices minus one. Now, I'm not going to write those values in here because, once again, I know they won't change, and I would just be repeating the exact same row two more times. 
but a computer has the time to do these computations for us and we're happy to let it. So that is how the Bellman Ford algorithm works. Once again, the answers are identical to those produced by Dijkstra's algorithm, but the amount of information needed about this network is less and therefore makes this algorithm slightly better suited to actual computation of shortest paths in real networks.